Okay, gang. So this is the uh, this is the eleventh meeting uh, of our of our class, the Cowell 126, the eight cases that changed America. We are discussing this week, uh, the, for the second week, the uh, Karen Silkwood case. This is part three of four parts. As you recall, uh, Sarah Nelson, the executive director of the, the major Karen Silkwood project, had in the first class, a week ago Tuesday, uh, given you the outlines of the major uh, national uproar around the uh, killing of Karen Silkwood, the various news bulletins and news stories from uh, the New York Times to Ms. Magazine to Rolling Stone and, and others, the major grassroots uh, education and organizing campaign that went on with the National Organization for Women to generate congressional hearings and the rather explosive congressional hearings that uh, took place around this, this case. And then in the uh, second uh, part, uh, last Thursday, I described generally the investigation process that we undertook to uh, find out what it is that happened to Karen Silkwood, uh, the answers to some of the mysteries, uh, the many mysteries that surrounded the events. Uh, today is the trial. I'm going to be dealing in detail with the trial. Uh, you, can, you can find, actually, the trial if you want to. Uh, it's, uh, you, you just punch into your Google, if you want to, just punch in uh, 485 capital F period, capital S-U-P-P, -P, uh, then the number 566, five, 485 Fed Sup uh, 566. There, there you will find a, a major, uh, I think, 59-page uh, explication on the part of Judge Frank Tice, uh, the chief federal judge from the state of Kansas, who was brought in uh, after we had two other federal judges recused, uh, taken off the case by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in the midst of the bloodbath that went on over the discovery in this case. Uh, he lays out a 59-page explication of what, how, how abundantly clear it was uh, about what happened with regard to count two in this case. Uh, you will recall that what, what the case what the case was really all about in the consciousness of the American people were uh, maybe four different things. One is it was a, a huge bruja about the killing of Karen Silkwood. Uh, that's what everybody was upset about. This appeared to be almost a major motion picture uh, mystery of Karen Silkwood having been killed, uh, while dramatically on her way in the middle of the night to deliver secret documents to a New York Times reporter, David Burnham, that was waiting for her, uh, but only to have been killed. Uh, and not only that, but that her car disappeared mysteriously and no one knew where it went to, and her body disappeared for, uh, for 28 uh, hours, actually, uh, only to turn up uh, as a Jane Doe uh, in the uh, Oklahoma City morgue. Uh, so the, the, the first and primary uh, matter that this was all about was about the dramatic killing of Karen Silkwood and the mystery of the disappearance of all of her documents. The second matter of the case was the major effort on the part of the uh, whole generation to basically discredit the science of uh, the private nuclear power industry. The big myth of the industry that it was uh, clean and safe, that it was basically eventually going to be too cheap to meter the attempt to expose the fact that this was a criminal fraud right from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the documents were available in the case to show that uh, immediately following the end of World War II with the detonation of the two atomic bombs uh, over Hiroshima in Nagasaki on August 6th and 9th of uh, 1945, the whole world was, uh, was horrified at the use of these type of uh, weapons of mass civilian destruction on the part of the United States. And there was a huge outcry to try to stop the production of these in the same way that there was a successful hue and cry at the end of World War I to outlaw the use of poison gas uh, in warfare. Uh, the United States uh, executive branch gathered uh, in Washington at, uh, in the face of this type of uproar 
and uh, tried to design a clandestine program that could rationalize and try to justify the continued experimentation with nuclear uh, explosives. Uh, and they came up with this idea. The documents are replete with this, the, the internal uh, classified documents inside the uh, administration of Truman, in which they came up with this, this Lulu uh, of an idea that maybe you could basically set off a nuclear bomb inside an adequate container uh, and slow it down enough that it could light your lights in your house. Uh, it, it's been described often as attempting to light your cigarette with a blowtorch. Uh, but but th this, these documents were available to us. And that there, so there was this major effort uh, on the part of an entire generation to discredit this fraudulent undertaking that was placing at risk uh, the American people and the environment. That was the major effort uh, in that there was going to be a major effort undertaken to basically level uh, massive liability onto the private nuclear industry uh, in the face of this effort, this ongoing effort that had been undertaken by the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration and was then followed up uh, even later uh, with the Johnson administration, that they were, they were attempting to cover for the private nuclear industry. They had designed an entire kind of legislative scheme by means of which they could try to shelter the private nuclear industry from crippling legal liabilities, financial liabilities. Uh, and so that there was this effort uh, to get around that and figure out how we could take a case that had such dramatic attention directed to it, of this killing of Karen Silkwood, and utilize it to, to, to level these types of massive damages against the private nuclear industry. The third thing that was going on, of course, in counter to that, was the effort of the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation uh, and Energy Corporation and the entire private nuclear industry to attempt to defame and ridicule uh, the, the critics of private nuclear power. Uh, they, they thought they had seized upon a classic example of Karen Silkwood, uh, this young, rather adventurous young woman who, uh, who was uh, accused of uh, smoking marijuana and, as I mentioned, actually going to bed with three different men inside of one year you know, they, they had this entire effort uh, going to besmirch her, and they were coming up with these lurid and, and basically kind of pornographic uh, explanations as to what had happened to her. Uh, and so the, 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 the stakes were extraordinarily high in this confrontation as it, as it came, uh, came to a head. In fact, you could safely say that it was a war. It was a war undertaken on the part of the baby boom generation against these men in gray, these uh, fat-assed corporate capitalists that were uh, basically uh, designing a, a scheme of, of, uh, of uh, fostering and promoting uh, nuclear weapons through this secret uh, theory that they had, they had developed a private way of making energy for us that would be too, too cheap to meter. Uh, and clean and safe. You kind of wondered why uh, capitalists would be trying to create something that was too cheap to meter, uh, that would basically be free energy, uh, but uh, b because it was originally under the auspices of the federal government, but then was very quickly put out into the hands of private uh, industry, and so that the the shibboleth of producing free nuclear uh, power for the people uh, didn't last very long at all. But the the point is, is that there was a, a very high uh, state of energy on both sides of this confrontation coming to the Karen Silkwood uh, trial. Uh, now you'll recall in our review uh, last Thursday of the facts that had been discovered during the course of the investigation and the civil discovery process, you'll recall that we established beyond any reasonable doubt that Karen Silkwood had been, her car had been rammed and run off the highway. Uh, when she was on her way to deliver these documents to David Burnham from the New York Times, there was a full-scale uh, automobile accident reconstruction undertaken uh, by A.O. Pipkin and the Texas Automobile, automobile Accident Reconstruction Firm. Uh, this was undertaken, interestingly enough, uh, immediately after the death, uh, as soon as we were able to recover uh, Karen's car. 
And uh, he came out to the scene. He came up from Texas and photographed the highway and the skid marks and everything else uh, in the big uh, tire marks on the side of the road uh, within 48 hours of her death, just 24 hours before the Oklahoma State Highway Department sent out a full crew to repave the highway a half a mile on each side of the death scene. Uh, and to plow up uh, the, 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 uh, all the grass and stuff along both sides of the road to destroy any evidence uh, of the, of the uh, death. Uh, we also established that, uh, that Karen Silkwood had the documents, that we, we brought on uh, various witnesses, eyewitnesses, to whom she had shown the documents uh, the night just within an hour before she was killed. And there was another event that I didn't get a chance to talk to you about last Thursday, but... We actually, we actually took the deposition of Ted Sebring. It turns out that where we discovered the car, the car had been taken away from the death scene uh, and people had seen it being taken away. And they saw that on the side of the, the tow truck, it said Ted Sebring's Ford dealership. And it turns out that Ted Sebring's Ford dealership was the, the garage that, that provided all the maintenance for all of the vehicles that were owned by the Kermagee Corporation. And so uh, Steve Wadka from the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union and the New York Times reporter David Burnham uh, and her, her boyfriend, uh, also they all went out and they found the car uh, in, that, in the garage. So they were able to go there the next day and get into the car, but none of the documents were there. So what we did during the discovery, we, we subpoenaed uh, Ted Sebring the owner of the Ford dealership. The first two judges blocked us, refused to let us take his deposition, saying that it was completely irrelevant. We finally, when Judge Tice came on to the case, the third federal judge on the case, and as you'll recall, I told you that he asserted in the first hearing that he was going to mandate that they turn over to us all of the discovery that had been being withheld from us by the previous two federal judges, and that uh, based on that, we were going to be able to either lay to rest this young Karen Silkwood once and for all, or her spirit was going to get up and walk in the courtroom. Because of that, we finally got the discovery, the deposition discovery on Ted Sebring, and I brought him into the deposition at the federal courthouse, and I sat him down and I started to have him tell us what happened on the night that she was killed. And he said at about 7.30, quarter to 8, he was contacted by Rick Fagan from the Oklahoma State uh, Highway Patrol, and asked to come to the scene. There, there was a, a death at the scene, and they needed to have the car taken away, he said. So he came. He thought this was a little unorthodox because he wasn't uh, on the, the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol a radio dispatch for, for towing uh, wrecks or anything. And uh, one of the things that wasn't known about at this time is there was, in fact, a, a, uh, a Oklahoma State Highway Patrol authorized uh, radio dispatched uh, tow truck that heard the, uh, the call uh, of the, the death. They'd heard the radio call from the 18-wheeler, that uh, the big truck that found her car turned over. And he jumped in his wrecker and started going to the scene. Uh, and he got about halfway there, and he received a radio transmission from the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol radio dispatcher ordering him to stand down. This was George Martin. And, uh, and uh, he couldn't believe it yeah, because they said that there was a woman found in the wreck. She may still be alive. The 18-wheeler the, the guys had seen her in the wreck. And so he, he disregarded the command to stop, and he kept on going. And finally, a second call came in and ordered him to cease and desist from going to the scene uh, and that if he persisted, his license would be revoked. And so Martin stood down, and uh, then Ted Sebring was contacted by Rick Fagan, the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol uh, guy in charge of the crash scene. And Ted Sebring said he came, and he got, the, he got the, uh, the car. And at that time, there was an unmarked black uh, hearse of some sort that was taking the body away. But it didn't have any markings on it. He didn't know where it was going to. Uh, he testified to this. And uh, he said that he, went, he brought the car and he brought it back to the garage and put it in his garage uh, and locked it up. And then he went to bed, went home, went to bed. He said he got a call, however, at about 12.15 midnight that night from the Oklahoma State uh, Highway Patrol radio dispatcher ordering him to, to get up and go down to the garage and open up the garage because there were some people from the Kerr-McGee Corporation 
that wanted to go in and inspect the car for potential radiation contamination. He told them that he wasn't going to do that. He said that unless he got a call personally from Rick Fagan, who was the Oklahoma State Highway Patrolman in charge of the death scene, that he would not allow anybody in the garage. He then testified under oath in the deposition that within 15 minutes he received a telephone call from Rick Fagan himself uh, telling him to come down to the garage and open up the garage that there were not only Kerr-McGee people but also people from the Atomic Energy Commission that wanted to come in and inspect the car. He testified that he got up in, uh, but, uh, but Rick Fagan told him not to tell anybody else. But, uh, uh, but he was very suspicious about this, and Ted Sebring uh, went to the home of Ken Valakat, who was his assistant at the, at the garage, and woke him up and insisted that he come with him. And so the two of them went down to the garage at about 12.45, quarter, about 10 minutes to 1, and they were waiting outside of the garage when, uh, when Rick Fagan came driving up in his patrol car with all the lights off completely, driving up to the garage. And he got out, and they waited a couple minutes, and then this huge white uh, uh, truck came pulling up with these big uh, communication dishes on the top of it. This great big huge white van pulled up, and three men got out of it wearing these big moon suits. And that the three of them, he said, then went into the garage, and Rick Fagan told Ken Valakat, he was very distressed that Ken Valakat had shown up here, along with Ted Sebring. But he ordered them to stay outside, well, of course, it was their garage, and they knew how to look in, so they went around to the side and climbed up and looked in the window. And, uh, and uh, Ted Sebring was testifying that he said, uh, I, I was there, and I said, what did you see? And he said, well, I looked in, and two of the guys in these moon suits were going around the car checking it with the Geiger counter. And I said, not surprisingly, where was the third guy? At which point he said, he was inside the car taking all the documents out of the car. At which point, Bill Paul, the uh, chief counsel for, uh, for Kerr McGee, jumps up and he says, wait, wait, stop. we got to stop this right now. I need to ask him some questions. I said, shut up and sit down. <laughs> I said, look, it, you can ask him whatever you want to ask him after I get done. This is my deposition. You know, you be quiet and we'll let him finish. He said, well, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression here. And I said, I don't think anybody's getting the wrong impression here. <laughs> And uh, so we, we continued on, and uh, he described these people taking all the documents out of the car. And, uh, and then we, we called Roy King uh, as a deposition. Roy King was the director of personnel at the Kerr-McGee plant. Turns out he had been contacted and had, had come to the scene. He was contacted by Rick Fagan because they found Karen Silkwood's Kerr-McGee ID badge uh, in the wreck. So they called the head of personnel from Kerr McGee and had him come to identify the body in the car when they took it out. And so he testified that he had done that, but he said in the deposition, he said, uh, uh, but Rick Fagan, the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol officer, approached him when they were taking the body away uh, in this mysterious dark limousine uh, uh, hearse of some sort with no, mar no markings on it. He said that Rick Fagan came over to him and said, look, there's an awful lot of Kerr McGee documents with Kerr McGee letterhead and stuff on them in the car. It's going to be important for you to come to the Ted Sebring's garage early in the morning and take all those documents out of the car, he said. And so, uh, so King was waiting the next morning very early for, for Rick Fagan to come. He didn't come, and he didn't come, and it got to be almost 10 o'clock. Finally, Rick Fagan came to, to, uh, to King's house and said, don't worry about it. Someone else has already taken care of that. Okay? So we were able to get Judge Tice to issue an order because we had a good idea of what was in the documents because Karen had been reading them over her home telephone, which turned out to be wiretapped. She was reading them over the phone to the officials of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, of, uh, that, uh, uh, Stephen Wadka. And so he had actually tape recorded some of those. So we had the tape recordings of her reading from the documents. And so we, we got Judge Tice to order them to turn over these documents to us, and we got them. So we were able to show in detail that these documents demonstrated they were missing over 40 pounds of 98% uh, pure bomb-grade plutonium from this facility. Uh, and so th that was also established. Uh, and so in addition, very importantly, we were able to demonstrate that Karen Silkwood had been contaminated in her home. 
not at the workplace. That this was extraordinarily important because we had, we had tried to subpoena uh, some of the material from her home to including her urine kits that were there at her home to try to run a, a radio uh, isotopic test on the, on the, the uh, contaminants to determine what lot number they came from. So we could determine where this contamination came from. Well, neither Judge Eubanks uh, nor Judge Luther Bohannon would allow us to get near that, was asserting that it was all national security, et cetera. But Judge Tice, when he came on, or ordered them to turn this stuff over to us. So we ran an isotopic test on this, and we subpoenaed a number of the batches of the type of material they were producing at the plant until we finally discovered that this contaminant in her home came from lot number 29 which had not even been in the plant for some four years. And that it was never there at any time Karen Silkwood was ever in the plant. And so that, uh, and, and as we started closing in on this to try to figure out who had possession of this and where it was kept by the Kerr-McGee uh, Corporation off-site somewhere, they jumped up and stipulated Kerr-McGee, Bill Paul, their attorney, jumped up and stipulated, okay, we'll stipulate that she was not contaminated at the plant, she was contaminated at her home, and we'll stipulate that it was lot number 29. Uh, but you have to stop this line of inquiry, Judge Tice. You can't let them keep on going into this area. And Judge Tice accepted the stipulation somewhere in the back of his mind, telling himself, okay, that's curtains for Kerr-McGee. You know, they've now walked right into it. There's a stipulation that she was contaminated at her home, that it was, that it was lot number 29, and it was their plutonium. So he figured that he, he had them uh, at that point. Now, we also established, of course, that Karen Silkwood was under surveillance, that it was being supervised by uh, J uh, James Reading, the chief of security for Kerr-McGee. We, we demonstrated that it was Larry Upchurch and Bill Byler and David McBride that were doing it. We had the tapes, as you recall, from Harold Barron's, uh, admitting that they had run her off the road on the highway, but they didn't intend to kill her. And as you'll recall, we had the evidence of the plutonium smuggling that uh, I discussed with you last Thursday. However, as I pointed out at the end of our discussion last Thursday, when we presented all the affidavits to Judge Tice, laying out how we had discovered now what was really going on here and why it was she was killed, all of a sudden, the, the Central Intelligence Agency contacted him and demanded to have a secret ex parte, that means excluding any other parties, in-camera discussion with him. And he came out of there and said, it, said that he was going to be dismissing count one of the complaint uh, on the grounds that the Federal Civil Rights Act, uh, which would protect her against Fourth Amendment violations of wiretapping, First Amendment violations of interference with her right to freedom of the press, uh, a violation of her Ninth Amendment right for, to travel for, safely on the highways and her statutory right to do so, uh, applied only to black people because the Federal Civil Rights Act had been passed immediately after the Civil War and Judge Tice uh, asserted that since the Civil War was fought solely for the purpose of freeing the black race from slavery, uh, that it was restricted to black people. And, uh, and therefore, he shut us off from being able to get at the complaint. Yes? Sorry. Uh, wouldn't that go against uh, the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause? Uh, the law can only apply to one race? Well, what, 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 they, what, they really, what they really argued is that it was derivative of the 13th Amendment, that, uh, that the statute had been passed pursuant to the 13th Amendment and 14th. And they, it, was, it, was a, it was a silly argument actually, but that's, that's what they argued. And it became very clear, it was immediately clear that Judge Tice uh, was doing this uh, because he wanted to boot that question up to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and give them a clear shot at the contamination count and, and get this other charge out of the case. But very importantly, and I'll tell you, that, uh, that uh, uh, I don't know whether I should spoil the good fun until we get to that point, but, but there, there, came, there came a point uh, at the, at, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now, so we, we'll, uh, we'll flash ahead a little bit, that when, when we got to the closing arguments after 11 solid weeks of trial, uh, and NBC <laughs> asked Bill Paul, the chief counsel for Kerr-McGee, uh, how did he feel here toward the end of, the, uh, end of this uh, case? And he said, I feel like I've been for 11 straight weeks standing under a waterfall, having it pour down on me. That was what he said. Uh, and uh, as, as we got to the closing arguments, the day of the closing arguments, we brought Karen Silkwood's three children into the, uh, into the courtroom 
put them up in the front row. Uh, and as you know, the, the, the case was the estate of Karen Silkwood versus the Kermagee Nuclear Corporation. So Bill Paul all of a sudden got terribly excited about all of this, and, uh, and he, he said he went up to the bench and said, Your Honor, we need to have a discussion in chambers. We need to have a discussion in chambers right away. So Judge Tice was kind of disgruntled because everybody was all assembled. The courtroom was all full of people, newspaper people from all over the country and radio and television. And so he said, okay, we're going to go into chambers. So we went into chambers, and Bill Paul said to him, uh, Judge Tice, he said, look, I want to object to these three children being put right there in front of the jury uh, for these closing arguments. Uh, you know, the, he said that uh, these, these three children are not really the parties in this case. It's the estate of Karen Silkwood. Well, I guess that... You know, they're probably the heirs to her estate. Well, I don't quite know how to refer to these children. And Judge Tice looked over his glasses and said, how about incipient millionaires? <laughs> <laughs> and, he said, and he said, oh, and by the way, as long as I have you in chambers here, Mr. Paul, let me raise another point. He said, if you so much as hint that Karen Silkwood did not have those documents in her car, on the night of November 13th of 1974, in your closing argument, if you so much as hint at that, I am going to stop your closing argument, I'm going to reopen this case, and I'm going to allow Mr. Sheehan, I'm going to reverse my position on count one, and I'm going to allow him to put in all of the evidence that he has about what happened to Karen Silkwood that night. He says, let me tell you this, based on 40 years of being a, a trial judge, he said, if that evidence goes into this case, this jury is going to conclude that Kermagee murdered Karen Silkwood. That's exactly what he said to them on the record in this case. Uh, and despite that, he had ruled that we weren't going to be allowed to have that in the case and sent it to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, authorizing an emergency appeal. As I mentioned, we, we argued that in March, on March 11th uh, of 1979, and it took the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals 18 well, no, it was to December of the following year to, uh, to rule on that. But the bottom line is that we went to the trial. We went to the trial on just the contamination count. And so the, the, this huge wrestling match took place around this issue. But very importantly, what we had done, we did an extraordinarily uh, rare thing. And it took me a while to pers persuade uh, Jerry Spence to do this. As I told you, we had Jerry Spence. We brought Jerry Spence in to try the count two on the contamination. I was going to be trying count one, prosecuting them for the death and for the contamination, for the smuggling of plutonium and all of that stuff. And he was going to try them on the contamination count. And uh, when the count one was tossed out, we had the trial just on count two. And so we, what I did is I persuaded him to put a, a, a set of special interrogatories to the jury, which plaintiff's lawyers virtually never want to do. They never want to put specific questions to the jury because if they answer those questions and there's any conceivable inconsistency between any two answers on the list, then the people who lose, the defendants, will go ape and they'll raise that in appeal. So plaintiff lawyers do not want that kind of specificity. They want to just generally toss the whole thing to the jury and when the jury says guilty and you know, give them 10 million bucks, uh, that they're basically bulletproof. So we finally got Jerry to agree to do this, and it was, it was quite uh, contrary to Jerry's normal uh, conduct. Now, Jerry Spence is someone you ought to take a look at. Jerry Spence, I have no doubt whatsoever, and I've been around a lot of, a lot of lawyers over 40, 45 years now, that Jerry Spence was, and probably still is to this day, the best trial lawyer alive. Uh, now, as I said on, uh, on CBS 60 Minutes, when we did the 60 Minutes show on this thing, you know, that isn't saying all that much. Uh, because <laughs> given, given the way that our legal system is, that it is so completely arbitrary and capricious, that it's basically, uh, it's basically the progeny of the old house champion system. You know, where back in the Middle Ages, if, if you said that, uh, that uh, your daughter was raped, by his son, and you're both royal houses, both of you are exempt from going in front of the king's bench as, as nobility. And so that what you would do instead is you would have the eldest son from your family meet on the field of honor against the eldest son of his family, and they would fight to the death. And whichever one came out alive, they're the ones that won. 
Now, now that, is, that is the origin of the, of the adversarial system in the American courtroom. Okay? And, and Jerry Spence is a stone killer. <laughs> a stone killer who operates off a little tiny speck of deep black hate at the very center of his soul. <laughs> As he confided to me one day. Uh, when, 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 when I, when I, and the, the, the way he got into this, I met him because uh, I was chief counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union for a while doing all of their trials for 10 states, for 10 of the states across the country. And uh, we were doing a big lawsuit uh, on behalf of the uh, Wyoming uh, State University student body. They had, uh, they had been stopped by the, by the president of Wyoming State University from showing a particular film that they, they got. They used to have Friday evening uh, film shows that were sponsored by the, the student body. And they somehow found a, an old four-minute, uh, eight-millimeter nude film of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, when she was like 20 years old or something, and they'd gotten their hands on it, and they were going to show it that night. And so the, the president of the university found out about it, and he ordered the, uh, the uh, actually the janitor to go find the film in their office and locked it up in his safe and wouldn't let them show it. So we sued him uh, for the ACLU. The ACLU sued them and, and got him up against the wall. And, and Jerry Spence, who lives in Wyoming, which is just barely large enough to contain him, uh, and uh, he said that uh, he had gotten word that, uh, that the Wyoming State University student body was suing the president of Wyoming State University, and he wanted to offer his services, that he would do the trial uh, against them if we wanted. Well, it turns out they collapsed and gave up and, and let them show the film, so we didn't have to do it. But I had met him, and so when we were doing the Silkwood case, I knew that he had more money than the Pope, uh, and so I, I called him, and said, you know, was he, was he possibly interested in making a contribution to the, to the Karen Silkwood case? And he said, oh, that Karen Silkwood case, I've heard a bunch about that. He said, uh, why don't you fly out to Wyoming here and talk with me about that, and I'll see about giving you a donation. So I flew out to his big ranch in Jackson Hole, and we sat down and had a long discussion about this. And uh, this is when he started confiding to me. Uh, he, he was kind of hinting that he might want to help do the trial on this thing, in addition to giving us a contribution, uh, actually, as it turns out, instead of giving us a contribution. Uh, but he, he said, uh, look, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I might be willing to help you on this if I could get a little more information about it. So I started asking him. I said, look, well, tell me this. I said, I've heard about you, obviously, and can you tell me what your, what's your favorite case out of all the different cases that you've done? What was your, what was your favorite case? And he said that... Uh, I was, I was contacted uh, many years ago back when, the, when they were building Disney, Disney World, not Disneyland in California, but Disney World down in Florida. I'm getting nods here that I'm not supposed to tell this story. Okay, I will, I will refrain from telling that story. So, okay, so, all right, uh, but b back to the trial. So, so here, here, is, here, here, we, are, here we are, we bring in Jerry Spence to do, to do uh, count, uh, one of the, and we get these special interrogatories put to the jury, right? And at the conclusion of all the evidence, these, the, they were asked specifically. They said, do you believe, as Kerr McGee has assert, asserted, Kerr McGee in their war on us had said that Karen Silkwood had taken this plutonium from the plant and intentionally brought it to her home and contaminated herself in order to try to embarrass Kerr McGee so that it would help them organize a union. And, uh, and so that we said, great. Let's put that to the jury. Do you believe that Karen Silkwood intentionally took plutonium from the plant and brought it home and contaminated herself to embarrass the, the plant or any other reason? And they said, absolutely not. Which spelled a certain amount of problem for Kerr McGee from that point on in answering the rest of the questions. But the second question is, do you find that the Kerr McGee Corporation was so negligent in its operation of the Cimarron facility that it allowed the escape of plutonium from the facility, which proximately caused the contamination of Karen Silkwood in her apartment 20 miles away from the plant. And they said, yes, we do. And then the judge said, well, what were her actual damages? Question three, $500,000. 
What are the punitive damages, if any, you think ought to be imposed against Kerr McGee to punish them for their reckless conduct? $10 million. Okay? So that uh, we thought that we had them pretty well locked down uh, with those types of questions, but that the, the trial itself, the trial itself reveals why it is that we dared to ask those specific questions to the jury because the, the, uh, the evidence that came in all during the 11 weeks of trial was so overwhelming against Kerr McGee that uh, they, they could barely stand it, actually. Uh, that we, we started out, for example, here come some of the little stories from the trial. So we, 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 have, we have this trial, right? We come in, we're in the, the Oklahoma Federal Courthouse, the one that got bombed, the famous Oklahoma courthouse that got bombed. Well, that's where we were. So we're there, we're there in the courthouse, and uh, we bring on as our first plaintiff's lawyer, because the plaintiffs go first, we bring on Dr. John Goffman. Dr. John Goffman is one of the world-renowned uh, experts on nuclear uh, safety and nuclear health. And, uh, and what he did is he, he got on the stand right off the bat and started to attack the standards of the Atomic Energy Commission. That the Atomic Energy Commission uh, had maintained that you could have a, a body burden of uh, 40 uh, nanograms of radioactivity uh, and it still wouldn't kill you. And, uh, and you could have 16 nanograms of radioactivity in your lungs and that it would not cause any immediate adverse health effects was their term. Like it means, <laughs> so when, when, uh, when Jerry Spence was talking to Dr. Goffman, uh, well actually he was talking to Dr. Volz, the, the lawyer, for the, the uh, specialist for the uh, Kerr McGee Corporation, and, and Dr. Volz said, yes, he said, uh, you could have 16 uh, nanograms in your lungs and 40 in your, uh, nanograms in your body, and it would cause no immediate adverse health effect. And Jerry Spence said to him, you mean like, your teeth falling out? And he said, yes, that would be one of those. He said, or your hair falling all out. He said, yes, that would be another one. He said, well, how about it, 10 years later developing cancer and having your entire insides eaten out by cancer? No, no, that would not be an immediate adverse health effect because that would take too long. And he said, so you mean that's what you mean? You don't mean then that it's safe. When you say that the exposure to 40 nanograms in your body and 16 in your lungs would cause no immediate adverse health effects, that's all that the AEC regulations provide for, isn't it? He said, yes, that would be right. At which point, you could, you could kind of hear the jaws drop on the jury, and they went, ah, oh, you know, what? You know, I mean, Kurt, Kurt McGee is standing here saying that, you know, we have, an, we have absolute immunity against any type of legal liability so long as we comport with the AEC standards. Well, it turns out, obviously, as we showed in the trial, the AEC standards had been developed under massive pressure from the private nuclear industry and that they were paying you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to the Congress people that were involved, in, to, in, uh, et cetera. Uh, and and as, as it turns out, uh, when we, when we put on Dr. John Goffman, our expert, to counter that, Dr. Goffman said that those standards were dramatically uh, too high. He said that these were probably like 10 times too high and, and probably more. He said that you know, they, should, they should not allow any kind of exposure of their people. And, and what we showed, the Kerr McGee plant was basically you know, maxing out these workers. They were getting them from like out of the local high school they were bringing them into the plant, and they would monitor them, and then when they all developed these 40, 40 nano, nanograms of body uh, uh, contamination and 16 grams in their lungs, they would, they would dismiss them. That, that was grounds for dismissal, you know? That's what they did. And so we showed that that's what was going on. And so Dr. John Goffman got up and said that, no, he thought that they were way too, way too high. They ought to be dramatically reduced. And Elliot Fenton, who was one of the assistants to, Dr., to uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, said to him, said, okay, now you've been having this running debate with the Atomic Energy Commission. Is that right? He said, yes, yes, I have. I've written many articles about it. I've contacted them. And so, so Elliot Fenton said, and you've communicated to the Atomic Energy Commission that you believe that those standards are way too high, don't, haven't you? And he said, yes. And they've done nothing to change them, have they? He said, no, no, they haven't. And so those are the present operating uh, standards that the Kerr-McGee plant uh, has to abide by. He said, yes, that's right. He said, 
thank you very much. And he turns around and starts to walk away. And Dr. John Goffman says to him, excuse me, Mr. Fenton. Uh, and, and Fenton makes the deadly mistake of turning around and going, yes, Dr. Goffman, what is it? And he said, I think there's something that I should tell you. And, and uh, Fenton said, what is that, Dr. Goffman? He said, I was the author of those Atomic Energy Commission standards. <laughs> the jury again went, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, this is the guy that wrote them, and he's sitting here dumping all over them and telling them they're absolutely disaster, and, and the Kermagee people weren't going to tell us that? So, uh, so we, we proceeded, we proceeded uh, through, through the trial. Uh, and and I, I remember in the, in the first week of the trial, the uh, statistical probability study that Kerr McGee was planning to put in to evidence to show that it, in fact, uh, that, that it, the probabilities of there being a serious release of plutonium from their facility were statistically infinitesimal. And it turns out that that particular study was totally destroyed. Uh, by UC Berkeley Maths Department that week, that first week, and they published a big major article about it. And Judge Tice, when, when, uh, uh, when Kerr McGee approached him about uh, wanting to remove that offer from their, their uh, evidence that they were proffering, Judge Tice kind of smiled at him. He said, well, he said, uh, kind of left you with your old uh, polka dot underwear kind of hanging out there, didn't it? He said to him, said to Bill Paul. <laughs> and and then, then in the second week of the trial, it turns out that the China Syndrome <clears throat> opened uh, in the movie theaters. This was a movie with Jane Fonda uh, and uh, who, was, who was the guy? Jack Lemmon. And it was all about a private nuclear facility, you know, uh, having a meltdown take place. And it was, a, it was a big hit all across the country and stuff. Well, Bill Paul was very upset about it. And he came, uh, he came, into, the, he came into the chambers at the beginning of the, the week. And he said, uh, Judge Tice, he said, look, uh, I object to this. I think I, I, want you, I want you to give an instruction to this jury that they're not to go see the China syndrome. <laughs> and uh, Judge Tice said, hey, look, I'd be happy to do that. He said, but I think I ought to tell you, if there's one thing that will guarantee that they will go see that movie, is my telling them not to. He said, so I'm perfectly willing to do it. And I want it clear on the record, I'm willing to do it, but you've been warned. So Bill Paul says, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and then the third, the third week, they had uh, William Ut Utnage that was on the stand. William Utnage was the guy that was the architect for the Kermagee nuclear plant. And so we were asking him, we said, look at uh, Mr. Utnage, can you tell me why is it that this plant that is working with 98% pure bomb-grade plutonium, the deadliest substance on the planet, why would it have been built right in the middle of Tornado Alley? Which is you know, where the news, the news uh, trucks are driving up and down the highways, you know, videoing tornadoes coming in, touching down here every spring. I mean, the sky turns green you know, starting in May. Uh, he said, you know, wh why, why is it that it was built there? Uh, and he said, oh, it just seemed like a very nice place, had a lot of flat land and stuff in there. And we said, yeah, could it be possibly that it's, a, that it's a Robert S. Kerr, who is a Kerr McGee, was the governor of the state? And it was in his home district. And that he was now the United States Senator and the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Could it be that it was built right in his home district? And he said, well, uh, I, I, I think it, you know, it, it it may be, it may be. Well, we said, it is, isn't it, in his home district? Yes, it is in his home district. He said, uh, but he said, look, uh, I want to guarantee you, he said, that this, pl this plant was built in such a way that it could take a direct hit from a tornado. We said, really? It got to be 5 o'clock that night, so we adjourned for the night, and we go back and we leave. And during that night, the biggest a chain of tornadoes hit in southern Oklahoma in the entire history of Oklahoma and wiped out like a four-mile square area, right? And it was on all the bulletins all the next morning. So we came, came into court the next morning. He's still on the stand, right? Comes back on the stand. Jerry Spence kind of shashays over on, you know, uh, Jerry Spence is about like six foot 20, you know, and he weighs about 270 pounds. Great big gigantic guy with a cowboy dangling coat on and stuff. And he kind of sashays on over to him and he leans down, he leans down on the, on the witness stand like this and he looks at him and he says, uh, and the jury started laughing. 
Jerry was laughing. Jerry stood there, let him laugh. And he turned around to the guy and he said, no more questions. <laughs> and I just walked away. Okay? And, uh, and, then in, and then in week four, in week four, they put on Alan Valentine, who was, the, who was the health physicist at the plant. He was the guy that wrote the health physics manual to explain to the people uh, you know, what ra radiation was all about and the, the precautions that maybe they should take, et cetera. And as it turns out, that we had a copy of the, the manual. And we, we blew up the picture. We blew these things up into these great big four foot by three foot pages, you know, so that everybody could read them on the jury. And, uh, and, it, and it turns out that, uh, that we, we, had the, we had the pages of the health manual. And then over here, we raised up a, an equal sized page from a 1959 Scientific American magazine article. And it turns out they were absolutely identical. That what he had done is he'd taken the health manual for the, the most dangerous plant in the entire country and he'd gotten it out of a, a scientific American. Except for all of those things that are in bright red over here in the article that tell you that it'll give you cancer. And let's count how many of them there are. And he, he went down just like this, like, like, like 12 of them, where it says, oh, and by the way, this will give you cancer. Except you come over here to the health manual, and it had been explicitly taken out. <laughs> and you could, if you listened closely, you could hear the cash register go off in the back of the courtroom, clang like that. I mean, because these guys were dead from that moment on. The, ju the jury was just absolutely livid with them. And so they put on their nicest guy, the guy they had sitting with them, this guy, this guy uh, Wayne Norwood. Wayne Norwood was the nicest guy. And he would sit right there with the lawyers, for, for the, the Kerr-McGee lawyers. That's this battalion of lawyers. And here's this little nerdy dude sitting there with them who's a real nice guy. And he gets up on the stand, and he is, he is the health and safety uh, director for the plant. And he gets up there, and, and, and Jerry Spence says to me, he says, uh, Mr. It, was, it was a very delicate job because you couldn't be mean to this guy because this was Mr. Nice Guy, right? And so Jerry says to him, he says, uh, Mr. Norwood, can you tell me, uh, you're the head of health and safety uh, at the plant. Is that correct? He said, yes, yes. He said, can you tell me what your, uh, what your educational background is? He said, uh, uh, I have a degree from a junior college in poultry husbandry. <laughs> <laughs> And Jerry sits there like this, kind of pulling on his jaw. He says, he said, uh, poultry husbandry, po chicken farmer. Is that, you're a chicken farmer. Is that it? Well, I wouldn't say a chicken farmer. Poultry, chicken farmer. You're a chicken farmer, aren't you? I mean, be honest. With you. You're a chicken. Yes, I'm a chicken farmer. He said. <laughs> and I mean, and, and, it, and it went on and on and on. Uh, and we put on, put on witnesses to show that they were, uh, that we've mentioned this in the past, that the, the people in the plant were so abysmally ignorant about the potential damaging nature of what they were working with is that they would actually take these pellets home with them. They would put them in their pocket and bring them home with them and give them to their children. So their children would take them to school and pass them around in their class for show and tell to show all the kids what these were. This is 98% pure bomb-grade plutonium, deadly plutonium, one nanogram of which actually in your lung will marry you to cancer. And they're handing them around to their children, right? And still trying to maintain to this jury that the, that the people at the plant were adequately instructed about the health dangers of plutonium. I also mentioned to you the incident where, they had, where we showed that, in fact, they had a 50-gallon drum of the uh, water, the contaminated radioactive water that they use in the process of, of uh, spinning these pellets out, uh, highly radioactive, and it, it, it split on the back of this truck and, and leaked uh, radioactive contaminant all over the truck, and so they took it downtown into the public car wash and basically washed it in a car wash and let all of that contamination go down into the public uh, sewage in the town. And, uh, and then there was the great one about they had a spill of radioactive water into the river, and we, we got the guys on the stand talking about how they'd been called in the middle of the night to put on big waders and go out into the river and scoop up hundreds and hundreds of dead fish that were floating to the surface uh, in the river so they could get rid of it so nobody would see it in the morning 
and never told a soul about that so that it went all the way on downstream to all the people that had that water downstream. So this, this went on and on uh, for 11 straight weeks until we got to the, to the final week. Uh, they had their final rebuttal witness on stand who was our friend Mr. Uh, Utnage, uh, Mr. Tornado, uh, who was, who was uh, what? Oh, 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 yes, 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 I should tell you this. This is the one that we, they, they had, uh, Dr. Volz was on the stand, and uh, he was, Dr. Volz was their health expert, and he was, he was sitting there saying that based on the nose swabs that were taken of Karen Silkwood when she was, you know, taken into custody and brought to the, uh, to the, uh, to the health lab uh, in Los Alamos, uh, she, she was brought to the, uh, to the lab there involuntarily and held there, right during the time when she was supposed to be scheduled to meet with David Burnham, coincidentally enough, that uh, she was taken there, and he said that they had, co uh, they had uh, copies of the health swab, the nose swab, and that predicated upon the nose swab, uh, we had calculated that she would have like, you know, 150 nanograms uh, of radioactivity deposited in her lungs. And our witness, Dr. John Goffman, had testified that this would have married her to cancer. So Volz gets up and says, no, no, based upon his analysis, uh, that there wouldn't have been 150, uh, 150 nanograms in her lungs. He said, in fact, we have a slide here of one of her, a slice of her lungs. And that it shows that there's just a few nanograms here in this slice. And if you extrapolate that out over the rest of her lung, uh, she, would not, she would have had only less than 16 nanograms. We sit there and look at each other like this in the crow. We say, where the hell did they get that? Because Karen Silkwood's body had disappeared, I told you. And when it was found 24, 28 hours later, it turns out that all of her internal organs were completely missing. All of her brain tissue and all of her lungs and intestines and liver and kidneys and everything. And so we, we stood up and, uh, and said, excuse me, Your Honor, uh, point of order here. Can, this wasn't on their list of exhibits. He said, oh, no, this was a rebuttal witness. We didn't have to have that on the list. We said, well, excuse me, can you tell us, you know, Your Honor, we'd like to have a little evidentiary hearing as to where they got this. And the, the Kermit Yee guys just kind of froze like that, like as if nobody was going to ask them, <laughs> you know? And they went, uh, well, we, we actually uh, uh, came into possession of this uh, from her autopsy. We said, well, it couldn't have been from her autopsy because she didn't have any lung tissue in her autopsy. So where did you get it? And so they finally fessed up that they, in fact, with the Atomic Energy Commission, had taken her body and had had, had it for 24 hours, and they, they're the ones that took all of her internal organs and stuff out of her, right? And so, so it, Judge Tice was just horrified. When, when this happened in the courtroom and when the jury sees the judge being horrified, they're twice as horrified, right? <laughs> and so, so we said, okay, but look, at if you got that one slice, how many slices did you take of her lungs? And they said, oh, more than that. We said, okay, Your Honor, we'd like to have an order right now that they turn over all of those to us. And the judge said, absolutely, turn them all over to them right now. So they handed them over to us and it showed when you put them all together that she had 25 times more radiation in her lungs than we had speculated. And they knew it. And they were concealing it from the jury. So this, this went on and on, as I said, until that we, got, we got to the... Yeah, that's right. We, we, got, we, got to the 11th, we got to the 11th week of the trial, and they bring back Mr. William Utnage, the Mr. Tornado guy, and he, he's on the stand trying to, trying to resurrect his testimony about how, well, you know, I, I didn't really mean that a direct hit would take it, et cetera, you know. And uh, we're, we're sitting there, and, and Bob Alvarez, the head of the, in the uh, Environmental Policy Center from Washington, D.C., comes into the courtroom and comes over to the bench. He goes, Psst. And I said, excuse me, Your Honor, uh, could I just step out for a moment? So I go, we go out in the hall, and he says, uh, the nuclear facility at Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania, is melting down as we speak. We said, oh, uh, okay, uh, let me get right back in there. So I go in, and I sit down, and I tell Jerry Spence. Jerry Spence wanders on over to Mr. Utnage, and he says, <laughs> Mr. Utnage, you know, you had this uh, statistical study uh, that you were going to put in here, uh, uh, telling how, how infinitesimally uh, uh, 
unlikely it was that they were going to have any kind of a serious accident, right, at this facility. And he said, oh, yes, oh, that'd be true. And he said, well, he says, so, so what you're saying is that, that study you were talking about actually applies to all the nuclear facilities. It's not just the Kerr McGee facility. He said, yeah, that's right, it's all of them. He said, so you would say that this, this facility here is as safe as virtually any one of the other facilities around the country. You can see it coming, can't you? And he says, yes, that's right. And he says, well, like, for example, how about the facility at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania? Would you say that this facility is as safe as that facility? Absolutely, he said. And that this, this, was, this Kerr McGee facility is no more likely to have a major catastrophic nuclear event than the Three Mile Island facility in New Hampshire? That's right, and, but, but no less likely. No, that would be right. That would be right, he says. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll adjourn for today. So we adjourn, right, on that one. And we go back, and we're going, oh, man, what a disaster for those guys. But, you know, we come back the next morning, and the whole jury is sitting there going <laughs> like this. And Bill Paul and his entire entourage of lawyers have been being so overwhelmed, it's absolutely true, they had not watched or heard the news. And they come back into the courtroom and, uh, and, and, and sit there. And Jerry Spence says, can this be true? I said, I think so. <laughs> and, and he went right after Mr. Utnage and just kept on digging on him. Oh, yes, absolutely. The Three Mile Island, were, you know, and just buried him like that. You know? And so, uh, so as I say, we, we, got, we got to the, to the end of the trial. Uh, and we put these uh, special interrogatories to the jury, and we had Judge Tice describe these children as incipient millionaires and threatened Bill Paul that he would put count one back into this case if Bill Paul even hinted that Karen Silkwood didn't have those documents that she had, which enabled us to put all of that evidence through those documents into the jury to show how completely you know, reckless uh, the operation of that plant really was. And so, so that, was, uh, that was how we got to there. And then there was this bizarre, uh, this bizarre sequence of events that happened right toward the end in chambers when we were talking about the instructions. Uh, there had been evidence put in that one of, one of Karen Silkwood's uh, urine samples that she was supposed to take after she got contaminated the first time, that uh, she was supposed to be doing these daily urine samples. And she brought these urine samples in and they were astronomically high. And as it turns out, uh, they had been spiked. And that's where lot number 29, lot number 29 had been put into her urine sample. And she had no access to lot number 29 at any time at all. And so we went through the, so Kerr McGee was trying, Kerr McGee had actually fabricated this defense that she had spiked her own urine samples, right? Uh, or she contaminated herself. And so we got to the point in the trial where we said, we said to them, okay, look, uh, why, don't you have, why don't we put this special interrogatory to the jury? Do you believe, we're going to have it even-handed, do you believe that Karen Silkwood intentionally put lot number 29 into her urine sample and was accidentally contaminated by it? And on the other hand, we'll have them ask, do you believe that any agent of the Kerr-McGee Corporation intentionally contaminated Karen Silkwood? And so they went, absolutely not. Kermagee said, no, we, we aren't going to have either one of those questions put to this jury. Okay? And so we, and Judge Tice said, well, look, at, you know, this thing of, you know, them, uh, if, if, she, if she contaminated herself, you know, that w by that particular stream, you know, why don't you, why don't you have the jury, why don't you ask the jury that? And they said, no, we don't, we maintain that that did not happen. That is not how this contamination happened. Uh, that we insist that she took some other lot number and contaminated herself. But we had already shown that the contamination on her person and in her house was all lot number 29. Okay? So they actually pushed back and would not allow that question of fact to be put to the jury. And despite the fact they had also stipulated to the fact that she was contaminated off-site in her home. And so that Judge Tice ruled that that if she had been contaminated off-site at her home and it had not been as a result of someone contaminating her urine sample and her accidentally spilling it at her house, uh, then in fact, obviously, the workman's compensation did not cover this particular injury because she'd not been contaminated at the plant 
and she hadn't been contaminated in the only other possible way that it might arguably be connected with the, her, her work, right? And so that was, that was the resolution of this. And, uh, and so that, that sets us up for the, for the workman's compensation argument that is going to be made here uh, by the Kermagee uh, lawyers after they got mashed with a $500,000 uh, actual damages and a $10 million uh, punitive damage, which was the, the largest civil judgment in the entire history of American jurisprudence up to that point in time. Uh, in that they then dashed to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals and, uh, and, and started uh, whining and uh, asking the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals to, uh, to place a workman's compensation restriction uh, on this event, despite the fact that there had been absolute stipulations that they had entered into to keep us from proving the details of how she'd been intentionally contaminated by them. They blocked us off on that one, and Judge Tice had tactically allowed them to do that because he thought that they were completely trapped thereby in having this type of liability. And the important uh, implications of this was, of course, or they were, of course, is that what this did is it ultimately, by allowing punitive damages to be imposed upon a private nuclear facility, it basically blew the lid off the potential limitations on liability. And, uh, and it was therefore declared unconstitutional uh, if, in fact, the, the Congress of the United States would have attempted to have restricted a common law right to punitive damages. And so that a, a big dispute arose, getting ready for the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, as to whether or not uh, the common law principles uh, of liability, tort liability for negligence, uh, and the, the consequent potential availability of punitive damages under state tort law uh, were allowed to be applied to the private nuclear industry. And Kerr McGee basically backed right up into a position of saying, look, their position was that as long as they abided by whatever the AEC rules and regulations were, that no matter what actual damage was caused by the operation of their plant, they were absolutely immunized against any legal liability. And Judge Tice took them right on on that. Uh, and in this 59-page opinion, uh, post-verdict opinion that he wrote, uh, he said that that could not be allowed to stand and that they had to be held liable uh, for punitive damage. And he said that the record amply reflected evidence supportive of the punitive damages finding and that, in fact, there was no possible reasonable conclusion that the jury could have come to other than the fact that Kerr McGee had, had contaminated Karen Silkwood. But he wouldn't, he did not let us get to the point of proving that they had intentionally contaminated her because that would have backed up and opened up the whole conspiracy charge that we were really after them over. Because if we could have shown that they intentionally contaminated her, then you're going to start opening up the whole probability that this was just an overt act of an ongoing criminal conspiracy against her. And that would have led to the revelation of the fact that she had stumbled upon the documents that showed that they were smuggling 98% uh, pure bomb-grade plutonium out of the facility with the knowledge and assistance of the Central Intelligence Agency to Israel uh, for nuclear weapons and to Iran at the same time. Uh, and so, so that, was, that was how the trial came out. And when the, when the verdict came out, uh, it, was, it was interesting. The, the verdict came out, and uh, it, the, it, was, it was this absolute uh, world-shattering precedent uh, of, of making the nuclear power industry basically uninsurable. Uh, and as I said, from, from that point on, from that date in June of 1979 up until this February, not one single new private nuclear power plant had been ordered or built in the United States. Uh, and it was of such mo momentous uh, import that all of, the, all of the bulletins went out across the country from that morning, about 10.30 in the morning, interrupted all of the soap operas uh, throughout the entire country. And they, they anticipate that some 35 million people uh, were notified in those bulletins that, uh, that, the, that the private nuclear industry was, was uh, on its deathbed 
at that point. So that's, that's the Karen Silkwood trial itself. Uh, we've got uh, another 20 minutes where we can, uh, we can talk and uh, you can ask questions about it. And the, any questions you have about the appeal in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, we'll deal with uh, on Thursday because we're going to address those things. But I would suggest that if you want to, uh, and I'm not, you're not going to get tested on or anything, but, but you should take a look at uh, Judge Tice's opinion. You know, at uh, 485 Fed Sup 566, and you, you'll see the you'll see the the vigor and uh, and aggressiveness with which he takes up this uh, this cause, uh, because he knew that he had cut us off from getting at the the true murder of Karen Silkwood, and that he had figured out this was compensation enough for us, and he thought that he was playing the true Democratic Party role of, uh, of kind of ameliorating the worst possible damage that could be inflicted upon one of the major corporate industries uh, and at the same time doing at least something uh, in the way of fairness for the people. The Democratic Party credo. <laughs> okay? So there, there we are. So if, if, there's any, if there's any questions you guys have got, uh, let's, uh, let's think about it. Hi. What, what, they were, what they were really trying to do is they were trying to inflict upon her a full lifetime body burden of radiation so that they could dismiss her from the plant. Oh, wow. That's what they were up to because they knew that she was going around holding these meetings, trying to organize people to support the union and talking about the health and safety standards. And so what, what they were going to do is just inflict a full-time body burden on her. So when she came into the plant, but, oh, lo and behold, she's contaminated and therefore uh, you're going to have to be dismissed and that you have no cause of action against us for unjust dismissal. That was, that was what that they was were doing. the only way they could think of to fire her. Well, it wasn't the only way they finally f figured out how to get rid of her. <laughs> fire her. Not yeah, right. Her. Yeah. Is there right. any uh, investigation into the, into the cor or corruption charges of the Oklahoma State Highway Patrol or any other governmental agency that were uh, responsible for the cover-up? Well, we, what we did is we, we named... We named uh, the, the certain officials, FBI, CIA, others, but the, the Court of Appeals ruled that given the fact that she was already dead, that they could not be held liable for violating her civil rights because she was already dead. And so the only officials you could really get to, that's one of the, that's one of the limitations on do, being a civil attorney, is you can bring causes of action, but it's hard to, but the the, if you bring them under the Civil Rights Act, they, it turns out they're really, you have to be alive to have your civil rights violated. And so the, the only real, real option you have left is going to Congress to get them to investigate this or go to the Justice Department. And the reality is the Justice Department is not going to be investigating something that the CIA is doing. By way of evidence, here's Glenn Whitaker, who is the lawyer for the FBI, marching the two Central Intelligence Agency guys into the courtroom to go into chambers to meet with Judge Tice to explain to them why he had to shut this case off because they were smuggling plutonium to Israel and Iran in South Africa. And so, you could have brought something against them on behalf of the people of the state of Oklahoma or the people of the, of the United States? No, they, they wouldn't really have any special standing. Uh, the, 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 real, the real challenge that you're raising is that, you know, if we're left to rely upon the Justice Department and public prosecutorial officials, and they are all part of the two political parties, they're, they're actually appointed as a function of their, of their service to the two political parties, you know, then, then obviously you have a limitation because they won't do anything that the two parties together agree they don't want done. And that's, that's the fundamental challenge when you, when you have to rely upon criminal statutes to enforce them. And we, we discover that over and over again. So what we, what we try to do is to create a, have a creative legal practice where we can devise civil causes of action that can get us in front of a jury as basically public prosecutors. And that's what the Silkwood case was. There was somebody, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, they, they put a lot of pressure on investigators and, uh, and all kinds of people. Did you guys get any blackmail or, or 
pressure from Kermit D or unknown individuals? Well, we're, we're totally immune from blackmail because we're extraordinarily pure. <laughs> <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, just coercion and threats. No, it's, uh, it's interesting. They, there's, there's, what? Oh, no, lots of people got killed. Oh, yeah, people got killed. I don't want to mean to be blasé about it. But, uh, yeah, we had lost about five different witnesses were murdered in this case. You know, in fact, Harold Barons was one of them. Harold Barons, once we cornered him in the Denny's and got him to blurt out what he had done, we end up, once Tice came on and we knew we could get subpoenas on these guys, we, Father Bill Davis served a subpoena on, uh, on Harold Barons. He had fled to Las Vegas. We tracked him down and he served him with a, with a subpoena. And two days later, he was murdered. He was knifed, and stabbed, and killed, uh, and left for dead, never solved. Uh, Leo Goodwin Jr., who was the head of the National Intelligence Academy, once we got a subpoena on him, uh, died of a massive heart attack and was uh, cremated uh, within 10 hours. Uh, that uh, Tom Bunting, the head of the Oklahoma State Bureau of Criminal Investigation, who was the guy who provided the actual wiretapping equipment from the National Intelligence Academy down to the Oklahoma City Police Department, uh, was, was dead within 24 hours of our serving a subpoena on him. Uh, and it, it was spooking uh, Judge Tice. You know, he was, he was getting concerned about actually issuing subpoenas uh, to the people that we were after. But I told him we, we didn't have any means of getting them in under oath in any other way. Uh, but but that's, what, uh, that's what was going on. So, so it wasn't, it, they didn't, they didn't uh, attack us. I mean, they, they, tried, they tried to, you know, they tried to get me held in contempt and other things uh, for, for uh, what was it? Oh, for not telling them who our sources were. <clears throat> that when, when, they, when they took the deposition of Bill, Bill Silkwood and they said, now, Mr. Silkwood, do you have any personal knowledge of anyone ever wiretapping your daughter, Karen? He said, no, no, I don't, but Mr. Sheehan does. And he said, well, do you have any evidence that anybody ran her off the road? Do you personally have any evidence? He said, oh, no, Mr. Sheehan has that evidence. You know, so we went through this whole process. And so they were kind of having this horrible kind of nightmare about considering whether they were going to subpoena me to testify as chief counsel for the other side. And, uh, and so they finally did do that. And, uh, and when, uh, when, they got me, when they got me under oath, I was saying, yeah, here's the evidence. You know, we did the, we did the investigation. Here's A.O. Pipkin, and I'm glad you raised this so now that we can get him into the record. And, so, and, so, and then they stopped the deposition, you know, because they realized what I was doing, just pouring it right on them, and it was a matter of official record here of all the evidence that we had against them. Uh, so that was, that was really as far as it went. There, there, there was the attempt to, 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 the attempt to kill Bill Taylor uh, when he was down at the National Intelligence Academy. That didn't work out well for them. Uh, there, was a, there, was a, there were a couple other instances like that. It didn't work out well at all for them. Uh, and so finally they, they ended up not doing anything more to us. And they, they ultimately figured that because they had the two judges in place, Luther Eubanks and Luther Bohannon, that they were just going to stifle us. They were just not going to let us get discovery. They, unless we could find out through our own independent investigation what was and get people to agree to testify, uh, you know, that, uh, that we weren't going to be able to get them. And I dare say that was partly what Judge Tice was doing. Judge Tice was allowing us to have all of these discovery things because he didn't think we were ever going to be able to get it. And that he was going to be able to just prior to, to trial say, you don't have enough evidence on count one. And so that he had to resort to that bizarre and rather ridiculous ruling, uh, you know, that only black people are protected under the Federal Civil Rights Act. So, uh, so that's, that's how, that's what, the, the, the fact is, is that uh, the national security state has many arrows in its quiver. And so the, it, it does not usually have to resort to killing people uh, who are threatening uh, their, their security blanket, as it were. Uh, so, so they don't usually do that. But, but people who are part of their team, who they think are getting ready to talk, they view as betraying them. And then they're able to work up the adequate ire toward them to actually eliminate them. So you'll see that the people that got eliminated in our case turned out to be all part of the team on the other side. And that once we'd ID'd them and once we got them under subpoena, they ended up dead. So it's sort of like that is how it goes. I just had a question. Yeah. Uh, 
question um, referring back to what you said about people who are involved, like other people who are cr part of the corrupt investigation. Mm -hmm. Well, for example, for, yeah, yeah. Well, for for example, you could ask yourself, why in the world is it that Barack Obama absolutely refuses to allow any investigation of the people that did all the torturing of the of the people at Guantanamo? Why why is it that they don't why is it they don't prosecute any of those people? Why does he always say, look, we're not looking backward, we're looking forward, only? I mean, every criminal prosecution in the history of the world is looking backward toward a crime that's been committed. I mean, how, how bizarre is that? We, we won't look backward. I'm not looking. I'm not looking is what it's doing. And, you know, and, so, and that's one of the reasons that they're so afraid right now. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, just uh, today's, yesterday morning, they began down at Guantanamo, they began the closed-door uh, trial in front of the military tribunal of the four guys that they say were the masterminds behind the 9-11 uh, attack on, on the Trade Center. And one of the things that they, one of the things that they stopped, they, the, the defendants refused to put on the earphones because they were doing the translations uh, and they've got a 40 second time delay on the translations for national security purposes. And what they were doing is that two of the defendants said they didn't want to put the earphones on because they had been tortured by putting ear, tying them down, strapping them down, putting earphones on them and blasting huge, loud American music into their ears for hours after hours so they couldn't sleep and stuff. And so the, they tried to, they started saying that when they tried to get them to put on the earphones and uh, they cut it all out of the transcript because they didn't want any reference made to the torture. And the reason for it is, is they don't want any official record of any of these people having been tortured because it would put pressure on the Justice Department to have to try to do something about it if they allow the official record to have any of this on there. So that's what they've done. And that's why when, when they were asked to do, investigate uh, John Yu uh, and, uh, and David Addington and the others that wrote up all the memos authorizing the torture of all these people, the, the Obama administration delegated it to, uh, to Holder, the Attorney General, and he said, uh, I've looked into this and I've decided as a matter of policy I'm not going to pursue any of the people who wrote any of those memos authorizing it. And as a result, we aren't going to investigate or prosecute anybody who were obeying those memos. So those people can't be prosecuted either. The only people that could be prosecuted is the people who knew what the rules were and did something personally outside of that, over and above it. Those kind of lowly people, we may prosecute a few of those. So, so the, the question becomes even more dramatic than the one you asked. Uh, the, it's it's uh, the, your question on steroids. You know, it's just, you know, what the hell's going on here? You know, is there any such thing as the rule of law? Uh, or, in fact, uh, does this na has this national security state risen to the point now where there's almost nothing that can be done about it uh, because both of the two political parties have joined forces in endorsing this major national security state bureaucracy which is basically attempting to foist its economic and political and military hegemony uh, throughout the world that you're basically inside Rome you know at the height of the imperium and therefore what do you do about it that's the right question, and we'll, we'll get to that in the, in the last week of the course. That's right. That's right. They, they, shut, they shut down the Kermagee facility and they stopped the construction of probably another 200 uh, private nuclear power plants around the United States that would have been built over the last 35 year period. It's, it's absolutely true. With all the waste. Pardon? It, with all of their nuclear waste. You know, and so the, the, part of this conscientization of the American public through this case 
has enabled us to, for example, mobilize different cities throughout the country to actually have their city councils pass resolutions declaring their city or county to be nuclear-free zones of actually asserting that they will not allow any nuclear facilities inside their, their jurisdiction and they won't allow any of the waste to be carried through their jurisdiction to be deposited, for example, under Yucca Mountain uh, in New Mexico. They, they won't allow that. Uh, and so, so that, type of, that type of standing up on their back feet and kind of defying the national security state is really what has to happen. You know, that, that's uh, just to tip you a little bit as to where we're going to go when we get to, the, get to the last week or two of, of the course, you know, that w without, without a mobilized citizenry who are willing to stand and fight these people, uh, they will, in fact, exonerate each other uh, whenever you get them into the corner. They will fight you off and figure you can't get them to begin with, and they'll keep on pretending, a la, you know, Judge Tice, keep pretending that, oh, if you can only get the evidence together, we'll really do something about this. You know, we'll have Karen Silkwa get up and walk in this courtroom. But then when you surprise them and you show that you can actually get the information and the evidence and put it directly in front of them, they will crap out every time. And they will not do this. So there's, there's serious work that needs to be done. That's the whole point of this course. What about John Dingles and the... <clears throat> What, what, what John Dingle did, what John Dingle did, as I say, he, he got personally angry at Stansfield Turner for ignoring his request to communicate with him about this, this distribution of nuclear materials around the world. And so what he did is he, uh, he obviously went to the lengths of, of commandeering this nas national uh, security agency uh, satellite to monitor these people and prove absolutely that it was done. Uh, and, but what they do is they conceal the information in Washington. Even Dingle and, uh, and Peter Stockton never told anybody publicly about this. They, Dingle told, or Peter Stockton told us that they had found out this was true and that they had done it and that they confronted Stansfield Turner about it, et cetera. But they never did anything public about it, nor would the New York Times. You know, if you tell the New York Times about it, they won't, they won't do anything about it, you know? And so, so that... Uh, uh, the, it's, I'll, I'll close with this one, and it was, the, it was the thing I think I mentioned to you once before, but it's, it's worth repeating, that when, uh, when uh, Bob Fink, who was the investigator for Bella Abzug, the congresswoman I mentioned from New York with the great big hats and stuff, who chaired the, uh, the House Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Human Rights, uh, that when he got seconded over to the investigation of the intelligence abuses, the national security state intelligence abuses, that he told me, uh, he served as one of our investigators, he told me when I, when I communicated to him the stuff about the heroin smuggling going on in Southeast Asia and the, the smuggling of that heroin uh, through, through the Corsican Mafia into Cuba and that there was an entire Central Intelligence Agency officer, Paul Helliwell, in Havana that was actually you know, shipping in this heroin and it was being sold by Santos Traficante and the Mafia up in the United States, and the profits, part of them were being used to buy military equipment for the Kuomintang in, in Formosa against the, the national, uh, on behalf of the Nationalist Chinese. When I told him that, it looked, you know, the evidence that I was getting was showing that the Central Intelligence Agency was not only acquiescing in this being done, they were actively participating in it, providing aircraft and helicopters to fly this stuff around. And, and he, he laughed, and he said, look, you know, if you're, if, you're so, uh, if you're so ignorant that you don't know that the American Central Intelligence Agency was smuggling heroin out of the Golden Triangle to support the Kuomintang, then you're too ignorant to function effectively in Washington. But on the other hand, if you're so naive that you think you're going to go and tell the American people about this, you are too naive to ever be effective here in Washington. So, so understand what that means and that that's a credo of the newspapers and the journalists and the staff people in Congress. It's all part of a clique that exists inside the beltway that govern the country. And there's two political parties in it. And so what I, I would say in closing is I want you to keep an eye on something and because, because in, in Greece, 
on, over the weekend, there were elections. And the two major political parties in Greece, the right of center party and the center party, they both had, had been previously, they shared like 75% of all the voters. But over this weekend, because of the austerity program that's being mandated in Europe uh, by Germany, basically, to insist upon you know, all of the social services being cut back in Greece, that the political parties lost control. Those two, that coalition of those two main political parties, the center right and the center, very reflective of the old Republican Party and the Democratic Party, they've lost power. They fell to the, 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 the uh, right of center party has only 17%, 18% now of the vote. And the left party, the left party has 17.5% of the vote. And, and it is splintered now into seven political parties. There are seven political parties now in Greece who have a percentage of the vote and they have to try to assemble a coalition government. The thing is that a coalition government like that is, is not totally stable and it can't engage in things like major foreign wars and imposing major taxes on people and doing other kinds of things. So that that instability that is now manifest in, in Greece, you want to keep an eye on because that's the full-blown alternative to a two-party system where they work in tandem with each other and presently engage in locking out most of the population from really participating in governing. So we have to try to, in the final week that we're going to be together, try to discuss what the balance is here, how we, how we solve this problem, that these eight cases are just educating you to show what it looks like up close uh, as to what the limitations are and what we can do. One more. Before yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do all of that on okay. Thursday. Okay. Yeah, once we get through the appellate system and how they did it, then we're going to talk about the, the general issue of nuclear, private nuclear power and what the issues are. Okay? Uh, thank you, Jimmy. All right. Thank uh, you, you guys. <laughs>